I'm continuing my reading. What I'm doing in this series is to read through the entire standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This consists of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. I am reading in a chronological order of events, not according to publication or volume, so I will be skipping around a bit as I move along. Uh, right now, I am in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, he has just turned over the judgeship to Saul as the new king, and we will continue this in chapter 13. Now, I am outside, so you may hear various sounds in the background, especially cars driving by. I tried to find a place where the noise would be lessened, but, you know, what can you do? Chapter 13. Saul offers a burnt offering, and the Lord rejects him and chooses another captain over his people. How fast Saul falls. Look at that. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people... He sent every man to his tent, and Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba. And the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had an abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits, and some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So Saul got his army together, marched on, destroyed a garrison of the Philistines. Philistines are coming to retaliate, and Israel goes into hiding. They flee into the mountains, into caves. Some of them even cross the Jordan, going as far east as they can to escape the Philistines, because the Philistines are in the west. But Saul remains in Gilgal. So here we go, verse 8. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. So this is it. Saul sees his army fleeing. They're scattering. And he's saying, look, Samuel said to wait seven days. He'd be here, but he's not here. So I'm going to do the sacrifice myself so that I can get the, the army together and we can go fight the Philistines. I don't think that Saul is acting maliciously here. He's not. I don't think he's saying, oh, I'm, I'm all that. I think he's saying he, he's, he needs something to bring the army back together. He's seeing his army flee. And so he performs the offering himself so that he can try and unite the army. Now, this was still, he still, he didn't have the authority to do this, and we'll read about that in a second, but it's, it shows a lack of trust in God on Saul's part. And that's the, that's the important thing. Let's read a little more, and then we'll talk about it a little more. Verse 11, And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. 
And Samuel arose and gat him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about six hundred men. And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. So, like he said, that you have done foolishly, you have not kept the commandment of God. Saul, and what he's saying is, I saw the army fleeing and I needed to unite him. So, you know, I know I wasn't supposed to, but in order to get the people together, I, I just, I, I had to do it. I, I forced myself. I, I didn't want to, but I just, I, I forced myself to do it. It just, he's saying that he did not trust God. He feared what was happening and he let his fear get the better of him. And instead of trusting God and trusting what the prophets had told him, he went and decided he knew better that he was going to do it. But we we'll also note here, it says he has only 600 men with him now. He originally had 3,000. So he was right. His army was scattering. His army was fleeing every which way. They were scared of the Philistines. He did not trust the Lord. This is his fault. His initial fault. But he's not removed from being king. He's just told that his kingdom will not continue. So, I have to say, in this particular instance, I'm not sure how many people wouldn't have acted like Saul. But it's not, it's not that Saul was being evil. He wasn't doing idol worship. He wasn't claiming the priesthood. He wasn't doing any of these things. He was trying to maintain his army. Because, like his father, he was a man of war. He was a, he was a warrior. And he put his trust in the army more than he put his trust in God. And that was the issue. Let us continue. Verse 17. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth to Ophrah, unto the land of Shul. And another company turned the way of Beth Horon, and another company turned to the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboam, toward the wilderness. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel, for the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, and his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle, that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. And the garrison, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Mm. So, the coulter is the blade on a plow for plowing the ground, and a mattock is a thing for digging worms, for grubbing. But this section here, this is a good section for our modern day. So the Philistines, not wanting the... Uh, Israelites to be able to make weapons and rise up in battle against them, banned all smiths. Does this start sounding familiar? They banned all weapon making. And the Israelites, if they needed to sharpen anything, had to go and hire a Philistine to do it for them. Or they could do it by hand with a file. So Saul and Jonathan have an army of 600 men. None of them have actual weapons, except Jonathan and Saul. They each have their weapon. It doesn't say if they have a sword or a spear. I think they had swords from later on, but they're the only ones that have actual weapons. The rest of the army don't know what they're fighting with. Maybe they're fighting with the, they might be fighting with their axes or their pitchforks, those kind of things. That wouldn't be uncommon. But weapon control in order to oppress people. That is what we are seeing here. The Philistines would not let Israel make weapons because they didn't want Israel fighting back. Interesting thought for our modern day. 